Okay, hello everyone. Um, I think we're all aware of this, but it's worth noting for the record anyway, at times life can be a bit of a bitch. Uh, my name's Stuart, and this is, in brief, my experience of toxic epidermal necrolysis syndrome. Uh, the cause was idiopathic. In June of 2006, I was a head chef. I'd been a chef since I was a schoolboy, and I loved it. I met my then partner in the job, and we'd recently got engaged. As if life weren't sweet enough, we had a seven-month-old son, and he was perfect. Life was great, but overnight, my world went up in smoke. Within 48 hours of admittance to my first hospital, the Royal Surrey in Guildford, I was deep into a ketamine-induced coma and on full life support. 24 hours later, I was transferred to St Thomas's Hospital here in London. I remained on full life support in a clean room for the next six weeks. It took me an entire book to detail my overall condition, my symptoms and hospital stay. I've had to condense it here, however, to the following. I lost 90% of my skin through second and third degree burns. My eyes fused shut, ulcerated, my tear film and tear production were destroyed with severe scarring to both the surface of the eyes and the eyelids, leaving me with bilateral surface failure and photophobia. My mouth and throat were severely burned with the destruction of my saliva glands, severe scarring to my tongue, gums, throat and the loss of enamel on my teeth. My mouth is now more composite than enamel. Stomach ulcers, a charred lung. This one's fun, especially for the men. My foreskin fused in place, blocking part of the urethra and welding in the catheter. There was only one way to get that out. My finger and toenails burned off. They never came back. I'd be visually impaired for the rest of my life and would be in chronic severe pain as a result of their condition. I can no longer effectively regulate my core temperature either due to the scarring over of most of my pores. But finally, after a six week coma, I left ICU. I'd lost more than a third of my body weight. I had the muscle mass of a baby and I had to learn to even walk again. I weighed just seven stone, but I was alive. I was moved from ICU earlier than planned for the sole purpose of emergency eye surgery. They cut away my eyelids from the surface of my eyes, grafted on as much amniotic membrane as they could get hold of, and began the treatment of the corneal ulcers. Upon removal of the tube from my throat, however, the monitors started going apeshit, and my mouth began overflowing with blood. The tube, as removed, had dragged across the raw and burned flesh and torn it open. A complication was that I was warfarinized. Were it not for the fast actions of the anaesthetist putting me deep under again to try and slow my blood pressure and buying some time to get in there and cauterize the offending leaks, I would now be dead. The next six weeks or so were spent finishing the regrowth of my skin, both inside and out, with physiotherapy, learning to eat and drink again and to talk properly, with treating my mouth, throat and stomach, which were all burned, bleeding and or ulcerated, managing my eyes, beginning the treatment of my genitals, and trying to reassert control over my then basket case of a mind. Some might say now as well. Ketamine is a bastard. It's brilliant, don't misunderstand me. It saved my life and stopped me from going to shock and cardiac arrest for as long as that was necessary. But its effect was to paint a very graphic and troubling set of nightmares. I call them coma dreams. That's the nature of the drug after all, but boy did my mind paint a picture. I still have those same nightmares in the same rich graphic detail to this day. I wake up shouting or shaking multiple times a week as a result. I'd love to expand on the lasting effects of this drug, but now is not the time. Even after 70 days in hospital, one of the most upsetting things I needed help with was to hold my baby boy in my arms. I simply did not have the strength to do this on my own. Not only did his dad look and smell differently, but his new dad couldn't even cuddle him unaided, and it broke my heart. Then began the task of trying to gain enough weight to be allowed to go home. I'd built an almost baby bird type relationship of deep trust and comfort with my ICU team. A crude form of imprinting, I guess. I ended up this way with my new team on this ward. After around 90 days, I was finally allowed home, and I was terrified, 
After so long, I felt more comfortable and more safe in hospital. My team had done what my family were told were impossible. They'd saved me. Despite such a triumph, they'd still learned lessons, though. Those lessons have now been applied in a way that benefits current and future SJS patients and, as a result, has produced better outcomes. A good example of this is that they gave me IVIG, which was then a huge gamble. Now, though, it's a staple of SJS treatment in hospitals all over the country and the world. Following the disaster after my eye surgery, the hospital put in place new protocols to make sure that an SJS patient is never at risk in that way again. If they can graft while the patient is still in the coma, they will. And if they can't, they now place the patient back into a brief drug-induced coma so that the throat has time to heal again before the tube is removed. The Royal Surrey, too, learned from their experience in my case. Some six years later, a gentleman turned up in their A&E presenting with very similar symptoms as I had. A doctor immediately nailed it and diagnosed SJS. That doctor was a junior on my case and remembered the initial presentation of symptoms in me. So you see, it's a learning curve. It's a hard one for sure, but the curve is in the right shape for the most part. Our healthcare system is great and is both learning constantly along with us as patients and researchers and is applying those hard-learned lessons on the ground, which is without question making a huge impact into the treatment of both SJS and TENS. I should have died a thousand times over. I'm a very lucky man and am immensely fortunate to have been treated by the teams I have been. One year later, though, in 2007, reality had set in. I'd lost it all, even hope. I'd lost my job, my career, my home. I'd had to move as a result to a different city, and so I'd left behind all of my friends. My partner had recently taken our son to visit her parents. She was from Melbourne, and after the year we'd had, it was a much-needed break for her. While she was there, she decided that neither of them were returning here to live, and it was the hardest phone call of my life. Truth be told, we were finished anyway, but the timing was soul-destroying. I'd now lost my son, too, the very reason I'd fought so damn hard to live in the first place. That day, something in me beyond the condition had been broken. On top of this, I was in permanent severe pain, newly blind and very lonely. My doctors were terrified of treating my many conditions, severe pain and depression, secondary to the TENS, for fear of another full-blown reaction. <coughs> The long and the short was it was too much of a risk. My whole world had shrunk into pain and nothing but. There were times I wished I'd die. So, how did I get through this? How does anyone? Well, it's not a very dramatic or glamorous answer, but put plainly, slowly. I had to take my time, rebuild my shattered confidence, not just in my body, but with the world at large. And I decided two things. One, I had to start taking risks, and two, I had to lead with my strength. Ironically, my biggest strength was the very thing that had weakened me, my condition. It took years of trial and error, heartache and pain, and I lost count of the surgeries in between. But I slowly started guessing there. Along the way, I did some volunteer advocate work with RNIB and Action for Blind People. I'd suffered sight loss, so I figured who better to be able to empathise with the daily struggles this entails than someone who lives with it. It was during this time that I also began writing my story. It took me years to finish. My eyes were so painful and so damaged that some days I could only write a few words. Other days, my eyes would bleed. But I got there. In 2013, I published the world's first patient account of going through this type of reaction. Like I said, I was leading with my strengths. Through Hampshire schools, I've started mentoring teenagers who live with chronic pain and disability. It's brilliant, but I think I take more away than they do. More recently, I've had the honor of becoming the Northwest Coast Research Community's patron, which is also amazing. They have a great team up there. As I grew in confidence, so too did my doctors. Together, we took some calculated risks on both treatment and surgeries. This was very much a joint effort. Some paid off, others did not. But either way, we learned a great deal, often more from the failures, and I doubt we'll ever stop learning. There are many in the patient community that place all of the responsibility for progress at the feet of the healthcare providers. Not only is this not fair, but it means that the prescribed treatment is almost doomed to fail. 
We have to put the work in at home. And I know it can be hard to do that. Painful too. Nobody ever said it was easy. I get sick of seeing patients slam our NHS and research communities. Just take the leap and trust. You'll be surprised at how things can change. In 2009, I saw an amazing man called Ken. He fitted me with scleral lenses. During that fitting, he asked me a very simple question. Is it better with or without? Such a simple question, but it changed my world. I started applying that question to every aspect of my treatment. If the answer was with, then it was a risk worth taking. As a result, my doctors and I started taking a chance and began medicating the problems that could be. My world opened up and I began living again. I even began enjoying life and, dare I say it, being happy with it. I am still in pain. I always will be. And yes, my life is harder than before. I've been told to lay off the booze by people who've taken one look at my red eyes and thought the worst of me. I'm called names for being on state welfare. I've even been told by some extended family, some of whom are in the healthcare and disability professions, that although I was liked by them, they were of the opinion that my other half, Pam, could do better than me, that she may be better off without a limiting life and with a normal person. However, Pam and I agree that both of our lives are far better with. We all have to deal with narrow-mindedness at times. All I can say is what's worked for me in situations like this. Be yourself, have decency, show compassion and empathy where you can, and speak your mind. And if all else fails, then try this. Simply say, fuck off. <laughs> People often ask me, though, about looking to the future and if it scares me or where the hope comes from to trust that things will get better. My answer is nearly always the same. You lot. The work you all do is for people like me hope. It's what you do every day that allows people like me to rebuild a life. I'd be dead in 2006 if it weren't for your work. So many risks were taken mid-reaction and they worked. Since then, my life has been put back together in large part from your blood, sweat, tears, imagination, and the huge risks you've all taken in getting your work out to us as patients. I cannot imagine how scary it must be trialing your research on the very first patient. That bravery doesn't go unnoticed or unappreciated. You've allowed me to smile again, to love again, and to want to be loved again. I've also built a wonderful relationship with my son in Australia, which for a while I was scared would be impossible under the circumstances. He's dealt with so much at such a young age and is not only my son, but my friend and someone I already look up to. He's remarkable. So those days where you're entering a billion lines of data into a spreadsheet and you realize you missed a line and have to start from scratch and you question all of your life choices. Never forget the end result, hope. For people like me, you give life, you allow me to plan my future and to face it with pride and dignity. I know very few of you get to see the end result, so you'll just have to take me at my word. It all makes a difference, even that pain in the ass spreadsheet. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. It's because of you I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. I want to leave you with a favorite quote of mine. It's from Arthur C. Clarke, and I think it perfectly sums up how I and patients and families like mine view what you do. He said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Make no mistake, what you do is magic. Thank you. <laughs>